You're listening to Inside Outside Innovation, episode 37. Today's interview features Jeff Gotthelf and Josh Seiden, the authors of Lean UX and their new book, Sense and Respond. They talk with Brian about the change in innovation among enterprises, from making the next cool new product to measuring in real time how users are responding to products. They also talked about the major shift in demographics among the organizations that are using Lean Startup to grow and innovate. Josh and Jeff's book, Sense and Respond, really focuses as well on engaging the executives and bridging the gap between the innovators and the executives in large corporations as they're trying to leverage these ideas for themselves. Hi there, everyone. I'm Vicki, producer of Inside Outside Innovation the podcast that brings you the latest insights from people who know the most about building lean businesses, innovating within corporations, and disrupting entire industries with passion and precision. Connect with our team on Twitter at the IO Podcast, or leave us a review on iTunes. Now, let's get started. So you've been in this space for quite a while. What are some of the kind of major changes you've seen? Obviously, it started out, you know, seemed to be embraced early on by startups, but now you're seeing a movement to, you know, existing organizations or corporations that seem to uh, take on this methodology as well. What are some of the things that you've seen uh, in the marketplace with regard to why this methodology and and system kind of has taken taken root, not only in startups, but in in other enterprises? We've seen a, a pretty remarkable transition in the market when it comes to organizational agility, lean startup in the enterprise, lean thinking, um, design thinking, that type of thing. You know, one of the first things that I noticed was Josh and I were co-founders of a consulting company called Neo based in New York, San Francisco. And um, when we started that company in 2012, we were trying to, uh, you know, the effort, the sales effort for us was one based on education. In other words, why is this different? Why do I have to change? Why do I have to think differently? And why is this different than the way I'm used to buying consulting services from other agencies, if you will? And in the four years, in the life of uh, Neo lasted about four years. By the end of the Neo life cycle, the conversations that we were having in the sales cycle were around differentiation. And so the, the market, the pendulum in the market swung from, we have no idea what this is, to everybody's now selling it or at least using the words in four years, which is unbelievably remarkable. And the conversation is, is even more, in fact, it's almost exclusively happening now in mid uh, high growth and large companies, which is where Josh and I spend a lot of our time. Mm-hmm. So, so what are the big differences that you're seeing with how maybe startups are deploying or using uh, the methodologies versus corporations? Or what are the kind of advantages and disadvantages to both sets? For me, I think and the, the big challenge is that the context of, uh, you know, in a small company, <clears throat> the context of sort of lean startup work is typically just a single team, right? And it's it's typically pretty easy to let that single team operate with great independence, right? So they can go off, they can they can chase an idea, they can learn their way forward, they can based on that learning, they can pivot to something new, and there are not a lot of external dependencies on that team, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so they have a lot of uh, what we sometimes call freedom of action. In a large organization, there are some teams that have some, you know. Uh, some freedom. T- typically, uh, you'll see those more independent teams kind of in the innovation areas of a company. But um, as you start to try to use the lean startup methods in um, on existing products, right, you get stuck in that context of that large organization that, that typically is asking for uh, predictability, right? So you're, you're typically funding your teams and you're saying, hey, team, we don't care about learning, or you're not explicitly saying that, but but you're saying we're, we're going to give you budget and you're going to produce these features, right? right? With the understanding that those those that feature set is supposed to solve a problem. Never mind if it does, though, right? 
you've signed up to deliver right. the feature. And so that coordination across multiple teams is, I think, one of the key challenges of um, of lean startup in large organizations, dealing with that kind of uncertainty and that kind of coordination. And, and that's one of the big things that we're writing about in um, in the new book. So that's probably a great seg- segue. Let's talk a little bit about Sense and Respond. And why did, uh, I know you guys wrote an original book, um, is it Lean UX? And so this is like the second in the series, so to speak. Uh, what's different and, and uh, what are you hoping to uh, communicate about this new book? The new book is a response to the feedback that we've gotten over the last three and a half years since Lean UX was published. Lean UX has done tremendously well and continues to sell well. And it was written as a a tactical guide to primarily designers and product managers looking to change the way that they practice in an increasingly agile world. We got lots of feedback over the years about the book, and perhaps the most dominant theme has been, we love this way of working. We want to work this way. My boss won't let me work this way. My company doesn't work this way. Right? But I, we, you know, and, that, and that came in over and over and over again. Josh and I do a lot of consulting. We teach a lot of workshops. And again, at, 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 the, at the end of every one of these, of these activities, of these events, the people in the room say, I wish my boss was here. I wish my boss could have heard you guys. And so Sense and Respond is a response, if you'll pardon the pun, to that feedback. And it's focused on executives, leaders, managers, executives in companies to explain to them two things. The first is that no matter what business they're in, they're in the software business first. In other words, if you want to be an organization of scale or if you want to scale in 21st century, you cannot do it without software. And that means that you're in the software business, regardless of what product or service you actually deliver to your customers. And so we spend the first half of the book making that case, showing case studies from a variety of industries, everything from agriculture to banking to automotive to, you know, pretty much everything, retail and fashion. Um, And then we spend the second half of the book assuming we've made a convincing case in the first half, right? The second half of the book says, now that you believe that you're in the software business, what does that mean for the way that you manage your company, for the way that you incentivize your teams, for the way that you hire, for the way that you plan and budget, for the way that you assign work to your teams? And the goal of that, those two segments of the complete book is to educate managers to start creating the kinds of cultures and processes that support these lean and agile ways of working. What we found in our consulting work over the years is that, again, all the the tactical teams, the product teams, they want to work this way and they're trying to work this way, but they're inevitably running up against a management organization that still doesn't understand it, still doesn't work this way, and and doesn't jive uh, well with this way of working. And so the book makes a a high-level case to executives about why they should rethink the way that they that they structure their their teams and the work and the incentives and so forth. I love it. I mean, I like this whole idea. Of, you know, everything's moving beyond technology almost uh, you know, towards a management infrastructure. You know, I used to be a Gartner consultant, and you know, when we went and sold Gartner, it was you know to the IT staff. Uh, and you know, now that you see, you know, software and technology is pervasive in anything, everything. And so I do think that that's the, the trend. And it's interesting to see how people will respond to that trend uh, in the coming years. Talk a little bit about uh, some of the kind of, you mentioned how difficult it is for corporations and, and folks to kind of implement this. What are some kind of maybe low hanging fruit? If there's a, a listener out there who's in one of these or- cubicles and saying, man, I wish I could make this happen. What are some either low hanging fruits or things that people can do to kind of uh, start making the Kool-Aid being drunk in the, in, in the executive class? So I think that, um, you know, if, if you're already bought into uh, a lean startup approach, right, you're bought into evidence-based decision-making and you're bought into sort of continuous feedback from your customer. Um, in order to have that conversation with uh, leadership, you have to sort of shift the conversation from hey, we've signed up to make a thing. And in the book, we call that an output. You, you, you have to shift away from signing up for outputs and towards a conversation about outcomes, right? 
So this quarter, our team is going to work on reducing cost of acquisition or whatever, whatever the some meaningful number to the business that leadership is likely to support. And then right, so it's not being driven by the, the product that you want to make or put into the world, or it's more being driven again by outcomes. Interesting. Exactly. Exactly. So it, it's not about we're going to make this big whizzy button or we're going to make this shiny new app. It's going to be about we're going to move some meaningful needle in the business. We, we have a hypothesis about how we're going to do it. We think it might be this button or this app, but we reserve the right to pivot if we're not making the progress that we all agree we need to make. And I think, I think that framing conversation is really, really important. If you can't get aligned at that level, it's very, very difficult to then put into play any of the kind of follow-on tactics. Can you, can you give a, good, a case study or an example of uh, some folks that have had a lot of success with kind of implementing these methodologies? We, we, have, we have several case studies in the book. I think um, one, one company that's doing uh, really interesting work in this space is a company called CarMax. Uh, CarMax is based in Richmond, Virginia, and they are a national used car retailer, which is interesting because they don't sell their cars online. They uh, use the digital channel to facilitate initial conversations, research with potential customers. And what they want is to get the the customers to the lots. And if you've ever been to a CarMax lot, they're massive. Mm -hmm. they're, they're huge used car lots. They want to get folks to the lot ready to purchase, aware of what they can afford, what it will cost them, what's available, what's the right car for them. And so they've got this, this, this feedback loop that's not just a digital one, but they've got to go work with the physical stores, the staff in the stores, create digital products that, that communicate effectively between customers the website, as well as the the uh, brick and mortar store itself. And they have really taken these ideas to heart. They've created small cross-functional teams. Those teams are assigned hypotheses. Mm -hmm. And the success criteria for those hypotheses are outcomes, like Josh was saying. They're not the hypothesis isn't, you know, we believe we will build this feature by Thursday. Right. The hypothesis is we believe that by building this particular or by taking this approach or building this particular interaction or, or offering the service, we will get more qualified users to the lot or we will, you know, we will reduce the number of people who walk away from the lot without purchasing something. Right. Uh, that's that's ultimately their goal. And so they then run a series of short experiments on the website. They then take the out comes of those experiments and they bring them to the physical store where they interact with the salespeople and they say, look, we're seeing these kinds of results from these digital experiments. This is the kind of information that that's yielding. Is this valuable to you as a, as a salesperson on the lot? And the salespeople will say, well, this is and this isn't. And so they have to kind of reformat that output and continue that feedback loop until they find a combination of online and offline experience that achieves the results that they're looking for. Or they don't, and then they give up on that, and they move on to, to whatever the next hypothesis is. But they've really adopted this and taken this to heart, and it's impressive because of that physical component. They've really blended it with, with, with the brick-and-mortar feedback loop as much as with the digital feedback loop. Well, it sounds like using this methodology, you have an opportunity to move faster uh, because you can get to a, a go, no go situation faster because you're actually talking with customers. You're not building out something that takes six months and then throwing it out to the market and hoping it, it works. You're kind of iteratively working through that learning process in the marketplace that then, you know, in theory should be able to make you move faster or, or eliminate some mistakes as you kind of build it out. I think, you know, one of the things about this is that you get results faster. And so the the feeling of speed is there, and and I think that that's really really important. Do you produce software and and spit out features at a higher rate of velocity? You know, probably not, right? But right. are you getting to meaningful business results faster? Are you getting to learning faster? Does it feel faster? My contention is, yeah. So uh, we had a chance to sit down a couple of weeks ago in San Francisco at the Lean Startup Conference. Uh, do you have any uh, kind of insights or, or things that uh, you saw uh, on the evolution of the, the, the Lean Startup movement in general that uh, you'd want to share with our audience? 
I think I think my biggest takeaway was where are the startups? <laughs> that was that was my biggest takeaway, right? It's called uh, the lean startup movement, right? I, I, I was working with somebody last week who said Eric Reese is a genius at everything except naming things. <laughs> like, <laughs> all, all of his concepts are amazing, right? But but the the, the names end up confusing people, like MVP, right? What's uh, you know the viable and the product aspect of it are not necessarily true, and I think the same thing is 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 what's happened to the lean startup movement is that it's moved well beyond startups. I think right. overwhelmingly the the people that I interacted with at that event were innovation consultants or uh, you know innovation catalysts within companies, uh, you know pe- people with with some kind of transformation role or an innovation role inside large companies. And I think that's the fascinating part in all of this is you've got large companies who are feeling the pinch from the startups that have become extremely successful. And they recognize that their current situations won't allow them to compete in a software-based world in any kind of meaningful way. And so they're seeking that secret sauce, that that kind of to recapture their younger days, if you will. And that's <laughs> who I met uh, at that event. And that was the, that was my biggest takeaway. I would have to agree with you. So um, to kind of recap here, uh, I know the book comes out, I think, sometime in February. Where can they find it? Where can they find out more information about Jeff and Josh and, and kind of stay connected to what you guys are building? Uh, so the book is available for pre-order now on uh, Amazon. You can learn more about both me and Jeff at our websites. Jeff is uh, jeffgothelf.com. I'm joshseiden.com. And you can follow us on Twitter. I'm jseiden. And uh, Jeff is J Boogie. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much for being on the Inside Outside Innovation Podcast today. Uh, looking forward to the book. Looking forward to digging in, and uh, looking forward to get you back on here at some time and uh, see how this uh, this next evolution goes. And uh, you know, things are always innovating, and we're excited to be a part of it. So, thank you for being on the show, and uh, we look forward to talking again soon. That's great. Thanks, Brian. That wraps up this week's Inside Outside Innovation. Big thank you to Jeff Godhelp and Josh Seiden for being our guests. We would love to connect with you through Twitter at The IO Podcast, and we encourage you to leave a review on iTunes. If you've got a topic or area you'd like us to dig into, let us know, because we'd love to pool our thoughts with other expert guests and discuss it on the show. Until next time, go out and innovate.